Well, go ahead and get up on your feet this morning, Christ Fellowship Church. What a beautiful day to be in the house this morning. Hey, take just a moment, greet somebody around you. Welcome them. If it's a first-time guest, welcome them to the church where nothing is impossible. As you greet each other in the house, we want to greet you right there in your house. We are so honored that you would choose to worship with us today at Christ Fellowship Church. Hey, get the whole family around you. Get your Bibles out. We're going to open up with Scripture in just a moment. And then worship with us. If we're standing, you stand. Be a part this morning. Don't just sit back and watch. Be a part. Engage this morning and watch the Lord engage with you in your house right there. Amen. Well, welcome to church, Christ Fellowship. This is the church where nothing is impossible. Amen. Well, we want to invite you to get your word this morning. Go to the book of Psalms. We want to look in the Old Testament this morning. We want to honor the Lord by the reading of the word. We, we shut the doors. We hold the guest off for just a moment. If you're in the house, we ask you to just let your feet find a resting place. Let's honor his word. He honors his word. We should honor his word. I want to look at Psalm 46 this morning. You ever read the scripture and you read it again and then you read it again and then something new jumps off the page at you? Each time you read it, something new. It's when the Logos becomes revelation. I love that. Well, this morning, I believe we'll get that from Psalm 46. The Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. A river brings joy to the city of our God, the sacred home of the Most High. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. From the very break of day, God will protect it. The nations are in chaos and their kingdoms crumble. Somebody said amen. Mm. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. Did you hear that? That's not just a word for the psalmist day. That's a word for today. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Come see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shield with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Can you say amen to the reading of the word? The psalmist put something in that, in that chapter twice. He said, the Lord, the God of Israel, is our fortress. That, that word fortress, he said it twice. It has two meanings. One, it's a, it's a valiant stronghold. But another definition is a person or a thing that is not affected by an outside influence or disturbance. We are in a country that is in chaos. We are in a country that is full of pollution and corruption. Would you agree? But I believe, I said it this morning in our Covenant Partners breakfast, I believe that even in, even in this great nation, in this pollution, I believe Jesus is the solution to that pollution. He is not affected by any outside influence or disturbance. He's not moved. He's not shaken. Therefore, we shouldn't be moved. We shouldn't be shaken. Matter of fact, we should run to that fortress this morning. We should run to him. We should fall into grace. We should come out of hiding and fall into his grace this morning. No matter where you've been or what you've done, the God of Israel is here among us, and he is a mighty fortress. Can we run to him this morning? I encourage you to put your Bibles down, step out into the aisle, step out down here in the front, make yourself ready to worship the king this morning. Can we lift our hands in the house? Can you lift the hands right there in your house? Father, today, pray this prayer. Lord, today, move in my life. Search my heart. Make me more like you. In Jesus' name, I worship you today. Amen.
Let's just begin to worship him. Just begin to worship. Let's begin to sing in our prayer language, amen? You have caught the attention of heaven this morning because everything's been about him. Everything has been about him. Come on, just pray it out. Pray it out. The language of angels right now, that's what's going on. The language of angels. Pray in your prayer language. Some of you may pray in English, sing in English. That's okay. Paul says to do both. I pray with understanding. I pray in the Spirit. I sing with understanding. I sing in the Spirit. So four different languages going on right now. Come on, just pray it out. Majesty, that is a royal title. That's a royal title. King of kings, Lord of lords. King of kings, Lord of lords. Come on, majesty. Worship his majesty. It's not about us in this moment, not praying for anything, but you're exalting him. Come on, you're exalting him. Put your heart and your mind on one thing that he's done for you. One thing and exalt him out of that. Thank him out of that. Come on, stretch, stretch, stretch. Just a couple more minutes. Let's go. Pray, pray, pray. Give him praise. Give him glory. The majestic one has come into the room. Lift him up this morning. Amen. We declare you King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus, there is none like you. There is none like you. We give you glory. We exalt you this morning. You are worthy, the only one worthy to sit on the throne. You're the only one worthy to sit on the throne. 
And right now, all of heaven joins us as we exalt you, as we praise you, as we lift you up and we declare you holy this morning. You are holy this morning, the Lamb of God, the Son of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's never failed you and he never will. He's never failed you and he never will. You're looking at that situation and you're thinking, how is this going to work? He'll work it. He will work it for your good and his glory. He will work it. So praise him out of that this morning. We thank you, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. We give you glory. We give you glory. And Father, this morning we dethrone ourselves and we enthrone you. We take ourselves off of the throne and we put you on the throne of our heart and our life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So good to have you in God's house this morning. Welcome to Christ Fellowship Church. As the lights come up, go and fellowship for a few moments. Enjoy one another. It's going to be a great day in Him today. Amen. Glory. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hey, thanks for being here. We love you. We're so glad you joined us. As we're here on site uh, hugging necks and just saying good morning, everybody. We just want to say thank you. Pastor Kieran is getting ready to take up an offering, and we want to give you the same opportunity to go ahead and give. He says in Malachi, in the Bible, that if you give your tithes into the storehouse, God will rebuke the devourer on your behalf. And he's got four ways to give today. You can see in the comment section, there's a link below that you can click to give, or you can give by Vimo, text, or you can mail us a check. Now, we're getting ready to go back into our, our, our service but we just want to say thank you so much for being there. You are part of our family. You are part of what makes things happen here. And we love you and appreciate you so much. God bless you. Let's go ahead and rejoin our service now. Go ahead and prepare your offering. We want to give Pastor Todd plenty of time this morning to bring the word. I know he's got some special Good. testimonies to share with you. We had the privilege of traveling uh, this weekend to Rocky Comfort, Missouri. And we were at the Gathering Tabernacle with Pastors Dan and Sarah Goostree. Had a wonderful time with them. And some amazing things happened in that, uh, that church out in the middle of nowhere, really. And so that was my trip to Missouri, first trip to Missouri, and it was such a pleasure. And people came from all over, just like they do here, from several hours away, from other states away, to come and meet Jesus in the water. So I know Pastor Todd's going to share a little bit about that. But before he comes and before we receive our offering, let me just uh, make one very quick announcement, very important announcement. Uh, we've had several people inquire about Caneo still, even though we closed the registration on July the 31st. We're going to reopen registration for four days. Four days. So those of you that have said, I missed it. What am I going to do now? I've missed it. Well, you haven't quite missed it yet. So from the 7th through the 10th, from the 7th through the 10th, you can still hop in and get on board to be with us this coming fall for classes. You can register at the table this morning. And tonight, our team will be at the table. We'll be happy to walk you through registration. You can also go to our website in the top toolbar, click on classes. Choose the class you will be enrolling in, and it will take you to a registration form. All right? We'll get you in the, in, uh, on the roll, and you'll begin to receive emails on what to do next. So, guys, don't wait. This is it. This is it. Four days only. Registration is open back up. Visit our website or visit us at the table, and we'll be happy to get you in. Currently, there are over 1,000 students that will be enrolled or are enrolled for classes this year. There are now over 600 year one students alone. Now, that's not here on Christ Fellowship Church campus. But nationwide, there are over 600 year one students. We're so excited. Uh, Caneo is now uh, on another continent. There are five pastors that will be gathering that will go through uh, Caneo 
uh, on the uh, continent of Africa. So we are finalizing things. Could not be more excited about what God is doing. He's got his hand on this ministry, and it's built on him, and it's built on who he is, and it's built on his word. So I know you'll want to be a part. Let's stand and receive our offering this morning. The Lord is good. So we're going to continue to worship in this way. Grab your offering. Let's speak over it this morning. Amen. Several ways to give there on the screen. And we don't want to forget about our missions effort. There is a yellow envelope in front of you for our missions effort. And as the borders all begin to open up more and more every day, there'll be more and more trips into more and more countries and nations. So we want to support that in every way that we can. Amen. Grab your offering and let's speak over it. Father, we thank you that we get to worship you this way. We get to co-labor with you this way. Lord, we thank you that you give seed to the sower. Some seed you plant, some seed you eat. This morning we're planting. So, Father, we just speak your life over this seed. May it go and do exactly what you intend for it to do so that the uncompromised gospel can continue to go forth from this house every day, every week. And Lord, that this building would be prepped and ready with everything that we need to minister to others as they come to meet you in the water. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Pastor Todd, this morning. Thank you, Lord. Wow, so good to see you this morning in the house of the Lord. The presence of God is in this room. I appreciate our worship team for leading us today. Thank the Lord that people are settling back down into their schedules. School has started back for many of you, and uh, we're excited about that. And your children, we want to pray for our children this morning and our young people that are going back into the uh, high schools as well as the elementary schools, middle schools. We want to pray for the power of God to fall upon them, that courage and boldness would literally overwhelm them and that they will not be indoctrinated with the doctrines of devils. I'm going to say that over here. I didn't hear anything over here. This group over here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's time we stand up against doctrines of devils. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Karen did mention a minute ago that we were in Rocky Comfort, Missouri. Uh, had a great time. Pastor Marty, uh, I think you guys baptized 78 people in South Carolina yesterday. Praise God. An impromptu baptism. <laughs> Karen and I leave for Oklahoma tomorrow, uh, early morning. Uh, we'll be baptizing close to 200 people in Oklahoma and God's moving. I just want to share a very quick testimony with you. You got time for a testimony? Okay, so we're in this garage. If, you, if you've never um, been to Rocky Comfort, which probably most of you have not, there's this pastor and his wife that got filled with the Holy Ghost here at the North Georgia Revival, decided to go back, their life so changed, to begin a church, and they're meeting in a garage a working man's garage, a farmer's garage. He just turned it into, opened it up and turned it into a church. You speak off of a trailer hit or a trailer, um, uh, one that you uh, pull behind your pickup truck. They just took the railings off and that's what you are preaching from. And it's, it's amazing. So this lady got into the water, young lady got into the water. And I just want you to hear her story and, and let's just rejoice with that. So uh, volume on that guy. So here we go.
got out, went to the bathroom to change, and I did it again, and I've been far back, and so, there's no pain. So been far back. She couldn't do that before. Touch your toes. Couldn't do that before. <laughs> so good, girl. Listen. That's awesome. over an hour to get to the building. And so she goes home the next day. Obviously, this was on Thursday. She goes home the next day and begins to tell people about it. And they knew her. And then a friend of theirs, two of them, come to give their life to Jesus. The gentleman on the right it wasn't not her friend, the young lady there, and then we gave an additional altar call, and her other friend came up and gave her life to the Lord as a result of the miracle that they witnessed in their friend's life. This is one of her friends that got into the water. The presence of the Lord touched her, and this is her other friend. Just got born again and the power of God falls on her. So here, here she is the next day. So last night on the way home, I called like 10 people and told them what Jesus did for me. And I told my sister and she came to my plans. story about this little fella here. Parents, listen to me. There is a move of God. And your children's flesh will fight it because they are accustomed to games and entertainment. And so we keep feeding them devices. Do you hear what I'm saying? Acclimate them to the presence of God where their spiritual thermometer will be able to recognize when they walk into an environment whether God is there or not. And let them witness and see the hand of God in action. Well, my kids are bored when they come to church. My kids don't like to come and sit here for two, three, four hours. So we give them a device and let them play video games for four, five, six hours at a time. You get to choose who influences your children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This little fella heard every testimony and he gets into the water and encounters God not for himself, but for his grandmother who has COPD. Parents, you will be held accountable for living in a historic move of God and not expose your children to that. Where they're at a weird age, all the more. I don't want to run them off the insanity of that. I don't want them to get better, so I'm not going to give them medicine. We wouldn't do that with a diagnosis, right? Well, we're not going to take them to the doctor because they're scared of doctors. Do you hear what I'm saying? Yes. Gets in the water 
and sits there for about 30 minutes in that posture for his grandmother. God moves quickly through children. Mm. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. They don't have the baggage, the garbage. Talk to me now. My Lord, waiting on a great report that this little child's faith is unlocking his grandmother's and literally obliterating the COPD in his grandmother's life. Come on now, somebody. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Stand your feet. I want to read a scripture to you today. I want you to go to Mark chapter 16, and we're going to be in several passages of scripture this morning. His kingdom come. As you're at Mark chapter 16. I'm going to turn to Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says in Mark chapter 16. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they'll cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That's a blueprint for the body of Christ. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Verse 19, so then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up to heaven, and then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Touch your neighbor and say, he sat down. Say it again, say, he sat down. And then they went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord working with them, and confirmed the word through the accompanying signs. My goodness. Father, bless your word this morning. May we dive into it and be forever changed by it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but we all have had critical turning points in our lives, moments that marked us, right? In fact, you are a compilation of your encounters, moments, pivotal times in our lives. And after that moment of encounter, that revelation, that pivotal moment, our lives are never the same. I remember the first time I met Karen. It was a pivotal moment. I remember the first time I got on a what they used to call a mini bike, a tiny motorcycle, and within seconds crashed my neighbor's mini bike. I'll never forget that moment. All throughout our lives, we have these moments that mark us. About seven years ago, eight years ago now, I had a moment, a juncture. I'm sitting in my office and I'm reading Mark chapter 16. And the Lord spoke to me clearly and he said, Todd, read that again. And it said, Lord, you went to heaven and you sat down. He said, read it again, put your eyes on it. And I read it. That one moment has redirected my understanding 
of my perspective of the plan and purpose of God for the earth and his children. Our church today has been impacted by that one moment. And God spoke to me and he said, Todd, do not build me a church full of attenders, but build me an army I could use. I want you to know this morning that God has sat down. He is seated. And he's not going to stand back up until he comes to get his bride. Only one time do we find Jesus standing after he was seated, after his resurrection. It was in Acts when Stephen was martyred and the Bible says he stood up. Today, Jesus is seated, and he is sitting down, and he's not going to stand up and to do what he has asked us to do. Mm. And this is nothing new. I want to go on a journey for about the next 10, 15 minutes, if you can stay with me. Look at Genesis chapter 1. This is nothing new. This has been the plan of God from the very beginning. Genesis chapter 1, I tell people all the time, if you can understand Genesis 1, mm -hmm. John 1, Acts 1, and Revelation 1, you have it all. You have the beginning. You have the purpose of Jesus. You have the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And how it's all going to end in Revelation 1. Genesis 1 verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male, female, then, he, then God blessed them, and he said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing on the earth. And God said, See, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Verse 1, chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had done. I find that's interesting that he rested when he had finished his work. He sat down. Verse 4, this is the history of the heavens and the earth where they were created. And that day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb and of the field had grown. For the Lord, now watch this, had not caused it to rain on the earth. And, there were, and here's the reason why. There was no man to till the ground. I need you to pause for a moment and understand that God created this blue sphere that you and I are on for his pleasure, but literally so that mankind, mankind can have a place to live. And you have to understand that God created this sphere and it never rained, it only missed it. No, don't miss that. There was just mist coming up and taking care of the vegetation, watering everything that was around, but not the heavy rain. So everything had a mist, therefore it was controlled growth. Growth was limited because of the mist. And God says, the reason I have caused it to not rain and only be a mist is because there's no man here to work it. Now think about that. How many 
places on the earth, churches, where there's just simply a mist and no rain. Simply enough water to sustain life, but no deluge of the rain of God. What determines a move of God in a congregation are broken, willing hearts. Mm -hmm. But men and women who are willing to work the move. I'm going to let that sink in for a moment. It is not that God does not want revival to come to every church. He desires it, but not every church has the manpower to facilitate and to host the rain and to deal with the growth. I don't know if that means to you what it means to me. Read on with me. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. Okay, watch this. He created the herbs. He created the tree. He created all the plants of the field. But he said, I cannot let it rain, only be a mist, because no man's able to water it or no man's able to till it and to take care of it. But then God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life, and man became a living being. Now watch this, verse eight. Then God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put what? The man whom he had formed. Before this, you have God creating man, creating animals. Talk to me. But the garden, God himself did not create it. He planted it. Lord, okay. He didn't say, this shrub come forth, this plant come forth. The Bible says that he planted. God took seed and placed it in soil. A garden came forth. God's a farmer. He created and made, but the Garden of Eden, talk to me now, he planted. He planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, let me just say a couple things here that may, be, uh, may uh, uh, give you some, uh, some understanding. When God created the earth, you need to understand that all of the earth was not like Eden. Eden, the Garden of Eden, wasn't demonstrated all over the earth. In fact, your Bible says that God planted a garden eastward in Eden and he put the man whom he had formed and out of the ground it grew the food. And then he put the tree of life. Verse 10, now a river went out of Eden to water the garden and from there it parted and became four river heads. And so you can find out in this biblical narrative that the garden of Eden is said to be in the east. That lets us know that there are other parts of the earth that did not look like Eden. It's sort of like, let's just take Georgia as being the whole earth, but God said, I'm gonna take the man that I'm creating, Adam and Eve, and I'm going to take them, and I'm first going to plant me a garden in Dawsonville, Georgia. And then I'm going to put these two in Dawsonville, Georgia. Everything in this garden is wonderful and beautiful and majestic and it's perfect in every way. But outside of that garden is different.
It's different than the garden. Look at what your Bible says. I want you to see this for yourself because this is, this is, this is important. Look at, look at uh, Genesis chapter two. Then the Lord God took the man and put him where? In the garden of Eden to do what? To tend it and to keep it. In other words, to cultivate it and to keep it. See, ever since began the beginning of humanity, man has been asked to work. It wasn't the fall that literally cursed us. I mean, it cursed us, but it was like, well, we would have never had to work if it hadn't have been for Adam and Eve. Come on, farmers, talk to me. Cultivating and keeping a garden is hard work. Now, this garden was perfect in every way. So it was a different type of farm than the farms that we have because I'm sure there weren't any weeds at that time. Talk to me now. But he said, I want you to cultivate it and to keep it. That's what I want you to do inside of this garden. But look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, verse 27. I want you to see this because I'm going somewhere with this. In verse 27, or verse 26, let me back up. He said, we're gonna make man in our image according to our likeness, and we want mankind to have what? Dominion over fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over what? Over all the earth. There's the garden, and then there's all the earth. Adam and Eve, I want you to live inside of this garden (laughs) and I want you to keep it and I want you to cultivate it. But according to what I want you to do in verse 26 of Genesis chapter one, verse 27, I now want you to take what you have in this garden and I want you to spread it eastward, northward, westward, and southward. I want everything, the whole earth to look just like this garden. That's what he says, basically, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. He says, I want you to have dominion over the sea, over the birds of the air, and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, verse 27. Look at it again. He created male and female. God blessed them. Then he says, I want you to be fruitful and to multiply. A lot of things going on here. Genesis 2, cultivate the garden, keep the garden. Genesis 1, 27, 28, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Fill the earth. Uh Uh-huh. Subdue it. Rule it. God's making, listen to me, guys. Listen, I know this is deep. This 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 is strong meat this morning. He makes an interesting distinctive or distinction between the earth and Eden. He said, be fruitful and multiply and fill and subdue the earth. The garden did not need to be subdued. It was perfect in every way. It was exactly what God wanted. It was what he desired for it to be. He said, I just need you to cultivate it and to watch over it. Subduing and cultivating are completely different. Well, what God created outside of the garden, was it perfect? It was perfect in a different way. But he says, Adam, I need you to take what you have in this room right here in this garden, and I need it to spread throughout the earth. And as you go, I need you to take dominion and authority and to bring under control wild things. Here's the assignment given to mankind. Ready? Cultivate, keep, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it. 
make the earth just like Eden. How in the world on God's green earth does that matter to us? If you will read the biblical narrative, you read the scripture with that in mind, Genesis chapter one, then you will understand why Jesus prayed Matthew chapter six. And when they asked him, teach us to pray, he said this. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come on just as it is in Eden again, so to speak. Heaven, perfect in every way. We've done messed it up. The whole world's contaminated. So now the only perfect thing is heaven. No sickness, no disease, no cancer, no rebellion, no prodigals. Perfect. And he says, now, here's how you pray. I want you to make what has happened in heaven a reality now on the earth. Eden has been destroyed. Bible says that when they fell, he destroyed, literally he put cherubims on the outside to guard lest anybody come in and come out. You talk to me now. And so now heaven is the perfect place. And he says this, I need you to pray that what is up in heaven will be transferred down through here. And I want you to pray that my will, which is in heaven, be the will of God on the earth. But if you'll remind, or if you'll remind yourself, when God completed all of that, Matthew, on the seventh day, he rested, he sat down. Jesus in John 17 sat down when he literally said this, God, I have finished the work you've given me to do. I'm done. I'm going to die, resurrect, sit at your right hand, but I have finished and I'm going to heaven and I'm sitting. And I need my people to take this kingdom to the earth. You see, this irritates people. This frustrates theologians, scholars, pastors, and teachers. They call what I'm about to tell you problematic. But listen to me. Most of all that God does on the earth today, he does it, but he does it through his people. And you can always find an anomaly, and lots of them, if you will, of God acting independent of man. But by and large, would you agree with me that most of what God does on the planet, on the planet, he does through someone. And this is how Jesus said, I, I, I finished my work. So I'm going back to the father, but now I need you to go do what I did. But don't go do what I did until you go to the upper room and I want you to stay in the upper room until the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of you. Now, now listen, don't think, well, that was the Holy Spirit. No, until Jesus himself comes to live on the inside of you. And so now, you doing it, he's just using your body to facilitate the work of the kingdom of God. That's why he says throughout the New Testament, what I'm looking for is a body. Present your body body a living sacrifice to the Lord. Does that make sense? But I feel strongly that we've been, we've been under um, a persuasion. We don't really have to do anything. God's got everything under control. Or that God is going to, he's working things out according to his perfect plan. And there are probably some truth to that, but by and large, you want to know the truth? A lot of the work of God's not getting done, not because he doesn't desire it, it's simply because there's no man to work the field. 
How many of you believe that the Lord would love to start a Bible study at the high schools? Right. Right. I don't even have to pray about that. Right. I mean, Lord, yeah. is it your will for you, for me to, to gather two or three people and begin praying and starting a Bible study on our study hall or break or whatever? And you know, and, you're, and, and, and Lord, if you, Lord, if you want that to happen, make it happen. And the Lord says, I want that to happen. But I'm not going to go down and teach it. If you want me to teach it, I'm sitting down. I've finished my work. And so what he's looking for is a body. And if I don't volunteer due to fear, frustration, feel I'm unworthy, I feel a lot of shame in my life, and I don't go teach, guess what happens? That Bible study never gets done. Therefore, the impact that it could have had in the high school does not become realized. So what God's doing on the earth largely is dependent on our response to him. Does that? There's just mist everywhere where God wants a deluge of power and glory and fire, but he says there's nobody there to work it. But when some woman, man, young person steps up, guess what happens? When they step up, Lord, I'll do it, I'll go. Here I am, send me. God says, I'm going to let it start raining in that high school. It's going to start raining in the high school. You know what? This church was under a mist for years. Until people started coming forward and just saying, Lord, here's my body. If you need me to pray, I pray. You need me to sit here, I'll sit here. If you need me to seek your face, I'll seek your face. Lord, whatever you want to do. And all of a sudden, the weather front, I mean, I'm talking about, listen, the, the whole weather pattern changed in our church. It started going from a mist and transitioning to a little sprinkle. All because of a people. Does that, does that make sense? Does that help anybody today? So some of us are asking, Lord, touch my school, touch my business, touch my family. And God's saying, okay. Can I use you? Now, all I need is your body. Because if you'll yield it to me, I will use your body and speak through it. And when you touch people with your physical body, it was as if I myself, God says, I will be touching them. I just need your body. I just need a body. That's why Romans 6 says that we present our body as an instrument to the Lord. Let him play it. He says, present your body as a slave unto righteousness. Lord, whatever you wish, I'll do it. Can I get an amen in this house? Amen. Mm. If we can capture this revelation... There will be no shortage of the power of God. Now, you're going to have to learn how to navigate through work and relationship. I work because I'm in relationship. I give him my body because I'm in relationship. I do not do it to earn his love. I do it because I am in love. You see what I'm saying? That's important to know. I give him my body because he has bought this body. He has redeemed it with his blood. The Bible says you've been bought with the price. Now, therefore, glorify God in your what? In your body. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, now, now watch this. This is important. This is where I get the emails and the letters that come in. We teach generally in the church that God is sovereign. Who's ever heard that word? Raise your hand. Okay, no, no. I love the word, but it's not a biblical word. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. If you go to the Hebrew text and the Greek text, you will not find the word 
sovereign. Which basically means God controls all things. He has such power and might that nothing happens unless he wills it, therefore desires it. I buy into the fact that God is sovereign according to the Webster Dictionary, but not for the made-up definition that has come down through Christianity. Israel is a sovereign state. America is a sovereign state. We are self-controlling, self-ruling. But it doesn't mean that I control Canada. It doesn't mean America controls Mexico because they too are sovereign, self-controlling, powerful, self-ruling nations. The church has come in and added definitions to sovereignty to make God into this every decision I make. He preordained it to the point that I can go to you right now and show you reformed pastors on video that you know and I know that are popular that would even say that the killing of the six million Jews by Hitler was a part of the providence perfect plan of God. Karen, am I telling the truth? They have so rearranged the word sovereign that they are fearful that if you say anything contrary to that, that you are weakening God. And they say it like this. It is because God gets glory that every aborted baby, every molested child was a part of God's perfect orchestrated plan. So that at the end, he would get glory. Now, let me tell you about sovereignty. It is not, it may be in your Bible. NIV has it everywhere over 300 times. Here's the word that they used. Are you ready? They translated, sob, replaced these two words with sovereignty. Lord Almighty. Everywhere that you see these two words, Lord Almighty in the Old Testament, they interjected, not according to the Hebrew text, but according to their own agenda to begin to teach people that God is in control of all things, good, evil, bad, ugly, rapes, murders, mass killings, wars, all because God wants to glory out of that. Andrew Womack said it's the most dangerous doctrine that has hit the church. And the reason it's dangerous is because it puts us in a state of relaxation. That, you know, God's, got, God's sovereign. Anything and everything that happens is according to his plan. Anything that ever happens is exactly the way he wants it. So why should I put forth effort to do anything if it's going to be done anyway. You can check me on this. You can check me. It's not, the word sovereign is not in your King James Bible. Nor your new King, new King James Version. It's not anywhere in the Hebrew and Greek text. Do I believe he's sovereign? Yeah, in the correct definition. Get some great teaching on this from Bill Johnson out of Bethel. Yeah. He will say God is sovereign. I will say he was sovereign in the context of the proper definition and not adding new words to make it fit a theological persuasion. Mostly, this was influenced by Calvinist. I'm going, yeah, I'm, I'm deep, Karen. I'm way out of there. You know what I'm saying? But, but, but this, is, this was introduced because of Calvinistic uh, persuasions. Which means a lot that there's predestination. 
I, I don't have time. <laughs> but but, but here, here's the point I'm, I'm making. The world is in the shape it is in today, not because God wants all this chaos. And he wants children to be sexually confused with their identity and persuasions, you know what I'm saying? And who they are sexually. Who would have ever thought in their right mind would think, well, this is perfect will of God. He's sovereign. He's working this out. I know my child was born a girl, but now she's six and now she doesn't know. Thank you, Lord, that you're sovereign and that you're getting glory out of my little girl who's going to have a sex change in three years. Nobody rational. No, 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 that's too hard. Re rewind that because, <laughs> because there are a lot of sm there are smarter people than I am, but they just, they have bought into this. They've just bought into it. And, and, and you go, you mean to tell me that rape last night of the 11 year old girl in her bedroom by her uncle that now she's impregnated. You want to look me square in the eye and say that was the will of God. No, here's, here's how it works. The uncle's over at the house. The Spirit of the Lord told the mom and dad, don't bring him in your house. Come on, go there. Go there. Well, he's my brother. I love my, I don't want him to be, he's gonna live on the street. The Lord says, do not bring him in your house. It's two o'clock in the morning. You're in the bed. You get awakened. The Lord says, go check on your daughter. You reach over and look at your phone. And start playing a game. Reading your feed. Fall back to sleep. Sons and daughters of God are led by the, the spirit of God. You are not a robot. Right. Choices I make today directly impact you are in those that I love. It's incumbent, imperative that as a parent, as a husband, that I, that I attune myself to the voice of God so I can react accordingly. And I'll give you an example. Last night at prayer, I tell you, I told our team this. I got a minute or two. We're in prayer. I get out of my car first and I come in, sitting in prayer, 20 minutes into prayer, the bottom falls out of the sky. It rained and rained some more. It was torrential. I'm sitting right there where you are, Karen, and I hear the Lord say to me, your windows are down. And I said, no, they're not. I did. I, I did. I said, Lord, no, they're not. Because I, I, I know I, my car never lowers its, their windows by itself. Because when I got out, they were up. He said, okay. <laughs> now, I, kid, I kid you not. I told the story last night. So I'm in prayer. Cody comes to us. One of my elders down to the front sits down next to me. I'm thinking, well, it's an emergency. He says, bro. Your windows are down. I go, really? It's funny how I believe him and not the Lord. But I literally just push that voice off. I go out there, and sure enough, I must have hit the app on my phone when I'm sitting there that said, vent your car which means it's going to lower the, every window this far. I go out there, and there's water in my seats like this thick. And the Lord had a good one on me. I'm sure he's like, I tried to tell you. And he says, don't even ask me to help you at this point. Right? Yeah. But see, that's how the kingdom works. That's how the advancement of his kingdom, taking 
the Garden of Eden and expanding it, his kingdom. Hear my voice. Listen to me. And there are catastrophic results when we don't listen. But then, because we've had the teaching of sovereignty, we will say, well, it just must have been God's will. Tell that to a mother who's bearing their teenager who committed suicide. Tell that to the children of the mom and dad who were killed in a car wreck. God is sovereign. Then why didn't you save my mama? Why didn't you do something? The preacher stands up and says, well, God's in control. He has placed me and you on this earth, not as robots, but as men and women who yield our lives to him and we trust him, we pray to him, we ask him to protect us, but, but know this, we live in a fallen world. And if the Lord says, do not cross through that stop sign, sit here, and I choose to ignore that voice, and then I'm in an accident. It's not God's fault. Well, couldn't he have stopped the car? Couldn't he have stopped the child from committing suicide? Couldn't he have stopped the drunk driver? Absolutely, but that's not how he set it up on the planet. You rule. You dominate under the lordship of Jesus with being filled with the Holy Spirit. This is why, and I close with this, this is why Romans 8, 28 is important, which says all things work together to good to those who love God and called according to his purpose. It doesn't mean all things are good. But in the midst of something catastrophic, here's what God's going to do. Sweetheart, I didn't cause this. This was not my will. But I'm going to work in the middle of this. I'm going to be in you. And I'm going to be your peace and comforter. But we're going to get through this together. Talk to me. Yes. Somebody talk to me. Yes. It puts most, if not all, the responsibility on me. Don't drink and drive. Don't text and drive. Well, I hit a tree and told my car, where was God? Three months earlier when your mother spoke to you and said, don't text and drive. When I prompted you, put it down, but you checked one more time. I didn't cause it. Your disobedience opened up a door and natural things happen. But I'm going to still be in the middle of this with you. I'm going to be in the middle of it with you. I didn't do it. He's gotten a bad rap. Sandy feet all across the road. He's gotten a bad rap. Crazy. Look at this scripture, Psalm 115, verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Let's rule it and dominate it and subdue it and take kingdom everywhere we go. Tonight, listen to me, tonight, Tonight, you know what's going to happen in this room? Kingdom. I'm going to say it again. You know what's going to happen in this room tonight? Kingdom. 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 
There, there's not gonna be a mist in the room. There's gonna be rain in the room because there are some people here that will work the fields. Bishop Lance Johnson to preach tonight. It's gonna to be absolute fire. Come early and pray with us. Here's how I pray. I say, Lord, there's gonna be all types of people that walk through that door today. Some have drugs in their body. Some have drugs in their car. A lover in an apartment. Suicidal thoughts. Tumors. Days to live. Broken marriages. Darkness and chaos abounds. Here's the prayer. Lord, for two hours, as they walk through that door, may you treat that entrance like the Garden of Eden. That everything that doesn't belong in your kingdom, everything that is dark and filled with death, may it fall off at the door. And people can come into this environment hear your voice, feel your love, know they're accepted. I walk that door, I walk that door. And I say, Lord, put your angels here. Make this a devil in proof environment and your kingdom come. Tonight, 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 from people all over the country will be here to encounter kingdom. May this be their night. There's great resistance in the spirit. I'm gonna say it, there's great resistance in the spirit because there's great potential. We're in an epic war, light and darkness. And the moment that we stop praying and seeking his face is the moment that darkness advances. And it can literally overwhelm us. But the more we pray, the more. So Father, you have found a people that we believe that our greatest days are now and in front of us. You're teaching us how to live, how to die, how to pray, and how to hear. So we yield our bodies. And everybody in this room said, amen, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Thank the Lord. All right. I will see you guys tonight at 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock prayer starts, our pre-production, our pre-meetings uh, at 4.30. Bless you guys. Thank you for being here.